This Rev3 Games preview is brought to you by Audible. It is my great pleasure to be here with Lucas Pope, the creator of Papers, Please. And I'll just happily say, this is one of the most incredible game experiences I've had in a very long time. Thank you, thank you so much for your time. Okay, well, thank you for uh, interviewing me. It's great. Um, so, I have many impressions having played the game, but I'm curious, what, what, what was your goal when you set out to make this game? Uh, my goal. Well, okay, so the idea came from passing through immigration on some trips uh, to Japan, basically. So I got the, I see the guy behind the counter working with the papers. I think, well, that's kind of cool. Whatever he's doing back there, he's like checking stuff and, you know, he stamps it crooked and he gives it back to you. I thought that would be a cool core mechanic. Uh, and then I started thinking about movies, spy movies like Bourne movies and things like that, where Jason Bourne or the spy is always trying to slip through immigration. And he's the hero. He's getting through immigration. He's like fooling everybody. Wouldn't it be great if you were the one on the other side of that, catching these guys trying to get through? So I thought there was a there was potential for story elements and intrigue and spies and smugglers. So on top of the core mechanics, I felt like there was a cool story to tell with that. And but, but what, what seems to come out of it is that the core mechanic is bureaucratic drudgery, and it becomes a, a, an almost obsessive type of of, of, of gameplay. Yeah, I guess uh, I enjoy that kind of stuff where you're actually, it's kind of OCD, you know, you're looking for all the discrepancies, you're like, you, you're working with too little space, there's not enough space on your desk, so you've got to shuffle all these papers around. For me, um, as a designer, that, that kind of worked well to set the whole thing in a bureaucracy because you've got kind of a fixed progression of, of complications and rules and things like that. So, you know, when I'm designing the game, I, I have this big pile of requirements and rules and features and stuff, and it, it became kind of easy, not easy, but it became uh, mechanical to lay that out in a progression for this story, so. Now, um, obviously you said you were inspired by immigration control uh, going through you know, the, the airports in Japan. I've done that myself, and while it's never a fun experience, it's, it's a little bit on the tame side, but yeah. the, the game itself is put in kind of a fictionalized yeah. Soviet where, where those, <laughs> those gates were held pretty strong. <laughs> yeah. you know, and. So what was the thinking to put it in what was, what's clearly a far more desperate situation? Uh, I guess just it comes from the narrative. So I needed an interesting narrative. And like you, I've never had any problem going through immigration. It's always been like a total breeze. So there's no like personal inspiration there. But I, just for me, the interesting narrative is when you have this oppressive society, this bureaucracy that you're kind of, you have to fight against it, but you also have to work within it to, to take care of your family. You know, you have your priorities. So. Just from a narrative perspective, I thought there was more. There's a rich environment here for, for storytelling. Well, but then there's there's, there's also I, I guess what I couldn't get over is how quickly I became that bureaucrat. You know, it was about five minutes, and even though it's a fictional situation, and you also have the context of your family needing food and electricity yeah. and water, like that immediately that it it, it, it took more prominence in how I played the game because I knew there were people that I wasn't letting through that probably deserved and vice versa. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, for me, that's really interesting that you, you find yourself in a situation where you're trying to do the right thing, but the right thing is not at all clear. You know, you can, you can help the people who are trying to get through or you can help your family. And that's kind of how I view a lot of things like there's a lot of politics mixed into immigration, but when you get down to the low level implementation, you find it's not that easy to deal with these issues. So I really wanted to make it also, I didn't want to make a statement about what's right or what's wrong, so a lot of this stuff is kind of open-ended or ambiguous, like you make decisions based on how you feel, but it, it's never, it's not always clear that you did the right thing. And there's, because there is no right thing, you know, you can say everything is right or everything is wrong, like you're really just trying to balance your priorities. And that, I, that was a goal for me, like to make the game more interesting, to make it more ambiguous and less clear. And that plays into the mechanics too, where it, the game doesn't explain everything to you, all the core mechanics, it doesn't explain them to you like very clearly in a tutorial or something. You kind of have to figure that stuff out for yourself. So that also carries over in the story where like you help somebody or you need to help somebody, but it's not clear that you should have helped them or that you, you know, that helping them was the right thing or anything. So, and that's how kind of how I view the real job of being an immig immigration inspector. You know, you look at somebody, you approve them or you deny them and then they're gone. You never see them again. You don't know what happens. So. Well, also the the graphical interface, uh, you know, it's it's not a, it's, it's not high res. It's not going for that kind of look. Um, I'm, I'm curious why you went that way. I found it to a really kind of really underscore kind of like what the spirit of the game was. Yeah, I uh, I basically got lucky there. Um, 
I picked a very simple like style because I, I'm the only guy working on the game, so I need something that I can implement you know quickly. The original plan was to make the game in six months, so I can't like spend a lot of time on 3D assets or resources and stuff like that. So I picked a really simple style with basic colors and flat shades and things like that. And uh, I did. I was trying to push the oppressiveness, so all the colors are muted and things like that, and the faces, you know, are a little bit rough. So I, I was going there, but really, I mean, it's mostly a technical like decision. Like I need to limit the the scope of the art. Well, that, that, that was kind of serendipitous, that, because I, I, I can't imagine the game looking any other way. Yeah. Um, also, for a game that I found to be borderline terrifying at times, just trying to maintain everything and the way I was making me feel while I was playing it, it has one of the funniest characters yeah. in games, which is the old man who just yeah, sort funny. of ineptly is trying to get through. Yeah, it's funny. Like, he was originally in the beta, he was just a... Uh, like a story element to explain the mechanic that comes up later, which is basically missing documents uh, or wrong documents. So he's he's a way to teach like the player how to how to deal with certain situations. And uh, after the beta, I had written a few more days. Uh, when I released the beta, it ends at day eight, but I actually had day nine and ten also in there and just cut it off. He comes through on day nine, uh, the day after the beta, and he's totally clear, and you never see him again. That's it. He's gone. Uh, but he was super popular from the beta, which I didn't expect at all. Uh, that's another just serendipitous, <laughs> like lucky as hell. And I decided I would try to incorporate him later uh, for a few more elements. And it ended up he he carried through the whole game and actually he became a, like a core critical character for the like the humanizing element of the entire game was this one guy who was really just just a funny throwaway thing at the beginning. So that worked out well. So now that you've worked on this game, and, and I got the sense that you were also prototyping similar ideas for a while. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think one was also a state-run newspaper. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was curious, like, is, is this a, a kind of system in a game that you would like to investigate further, or what's 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 next for Lucas Pope? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Immediately next is I need to port this to Linux, and I need to localize it. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about an iPad tablet version, Android tablet version. For next, next, it's hard to say. Like a lot of people uh, have asked me for more story in the same universe. Um, but one of the things I like to do is I like to do something new every time. That's what that's the challenge is what what I enjoy. So I haven't decided quite yet what I'm doing next. Honestly. Well, it's fine because I'm going to go back and keep on playing this game. It's become a point of obsession. Thank you so much for your time and congratulations. Thank you very much. So do you like this preview coverage and you want to support Rev3 Games? Then why not check out Audible? They have over 100,000 audiobooks and spoken word entertainment to be downloaded to your phone or MP3 player and played back anywhere, anytime. You can go to audiblepodcast.com slash Rev3Games to get a free audiobook of your choice when you sign up today.